Hi, Epiguro, this is finishing off the enlightenment. And so here we go, we've got our notes about the enlightenment and scientific re revolution together. Um, and we covered uh, these different philosophers of the uh, enlightenment or social scientists. Um, during this time, scientists were known as natural philosophers. The, the word they used for scientist. Philosopher means thinker, natural philosopher, thinking about nature, using observation and logic and reason. And then you have the Enlightenment philosophers in France. You've got the philosophes um, and then others. Uh, the one I <clears throat> forgot to mention who is uh, an important philosopher was Adam Smith, and specifically in economics and is known as the father of capitalism. Although, of course, capitalism, people competing for a profit um, existed before Adam Smith. As long as there have been human beings, they've been competing with each other to make profits. Um, but here, his contribution was that, what is he challenging? He's challenging mercantilism. Mercantilism. And look back at the absolutist chapter, mercantilism. That's what he challenges. So rather than the government having control over the economy in terms of putting up tariffs, um, Adam Smith's idea, he calls for, even though he's Scottish, he has this French phrase, laissez-faire, which basically says, leave it alone. Government should let business be alone. People are motivated by their own self-interest. And uh, also he talks about an invisible hand that will naturally guide people and society toward better things once um, you remove these constraints from government on the economy. And we know that in reality, what happens when you have laissez-faire capitalism, no government regulation, it's a horror show. Just think of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution with child labor, slavery, no government regulation of working conditions. That's what happens in a laissez-faire capitalistic society. Um, but in this time, it's, um, it's challenging the idea of absolutism and mercantilism. And so that's um, where Adam Smith fits in there. Uh, and look through your, you know, your crash course book for additional information about these guys called physiocrats who were um, people who were challenging mercantilism. Okay, um, the final part here is that there were um, a couple or a few monarchs who um, were known as enlightened despots. A despot is like a tyrant enlightened. So they were tyrants, but they were enlightened. Enlightened despots. Some kings uh, like Louis XV in France or um, Henry, uh, let's see, the, no, George, sorry, the third in England. They didn't care much about the Enlightenment, but there were a couple monarchs who did. One was Frederick the Great of Prussia. And this is the late 1800s, and he's Prussia. And you have Catherine the Great in Russia. And they are friends with philosophes. Um, they both knew Voltaire. Voltaire lived with Frederick the Great for a while. Um, Diderot lived with Catherine the Great and visited her. Um, and so they also had reforms such as um, religious toleration for both of them. Catherine the Great had a toleration of Jews in Russia, limited toleration of Jews. Frederick the Great um, had religious toleration in Prussia. However, um, also they um, either limited or stopped the use of torture. Um, and so limitations on torture for a, a little more fair criminal justice system. But in the big but is that they both continued serfdom. Continued. And so while there are some reforms and they may have been interested in enlightenment ideas, um, why do they continue serfdom? Well, because it's one way is it keeps the nobles happy and the nobles um, supported them with, with serfdom. There was an Austrian king, Joseph II, who actually got rid of serfdom, but then as soon as Joseph um, II died, serfdom came back in Austria. And so this is where feudalism is continuing in the eastern part of Russia. Catherine the Great comes up with a, um, with a plan to 
um, to change the Russian legal code, but there's a peasant rebellion called the Pugachev Rebellion, and after that she ends up torturing and killing him, and so going pretty much against all of these enlightened principles when, when her reign is threatened. Uh, Frederick the Great also, um, while he is uh, someone who plays the flute and uh, is uh, enlightened, uh, I guess you could say, as an artist, militarily, um, um, Prussia is extremely militaristic uh, and, uh, and they also expand their territory. He attacks um, Maria Theresa of Austria when she becomes queen and they gain more territory. Similarly, Catherine the Great gains more territory for Russia. Um, she uh, splitting Poland, the partition of Poland with Prussia and Austria. She takes Poland, she also takes part of the Ottoman Empire. So even though they're called enlightened despots, it's not necessarily for their actions because they were um, pretty despotic or tyrannical and militaristic and violent and against uh, the rights of, of the people. However, they had uh, correspondence and with some uh, ph philosophers. Frederick the Great also um, started some agricultural modernization policies. And, you know, this is the late 1700s, so the time of the agricultural revolution in England and the Netherlands. And so Frederick the Great adopts some of these during that time as well. But anyway, that's Enlightened Despots, which sort of rounds out um, the scientific revolution and enlightenment. All right.